Capital is an abstract parasite, an insatiable vampire and zombie maker. But the living flesh it converts into dead labor is ours, and the zombies it makes are us. Hello, my name is Eugene. My name is TK Jones. And today we're going to talk about capitalist realism and how do we overcome it. A lot of fights. Ten years ago, Mark Fisher came out with a very, very important book, uh, Capitalist Realism. And tonight, me and uh, my good friend Luchido of the People, TK Jones, are going to talk about that. So, TK, how's it going? I am doing pretty well, I must say. I'm glad I got my phone working again and hopefully recording. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello. Hopefully. <laughs> waving at the camera. You know. Feels good to be under the mask again, although... Um, I think I've got a bit of stubble down here, so ignore the neck beard. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a neck beard if it's just the neck. If it's not just the neck, so yeah, don't I'm, worry about that. Well, they can't tell because of the mask. I, I may or may not have a goatee under here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just have a fucking uh, neck I, beard. So I, I tell you what, what's I do in the have, news though? ticket? I have a surprise flex. Oh, oh, yeah. damn. Uh, yeah. We're doing it. We're do going there. We're going there. The s shout out to the Swolitariat, um, <laughs> uh and all the proud members of uh, such an amazing group, a Swolitariat. So tonight <laughs> we have a very, very interesting book to talk about. Um, it's a very interesting book because it describes a very, very interesting condition. Mm. So I think that if we um, if we should start with something, let's start with the first line in the book. Hmm. Uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And hmm. I think that it's a very, very popular phrase that you may have heard Zizek say, you may have heard people on the Zero Books uh, say, actually, this book is uh, basically uh, printed by Zero Books, and uh, you can buy the book, purchase the book, and link down in the description, which leads to the official side of our good friends from Zero Books. Shout out to Zero Books. Um, so, it is a very interesting phrase, isn't it? Yeah, it is I, I think you find in a lot of that. media, when people try mm -hmm. to imagine a, f uh, a future, either it becomes incredibly dystopian, and... Mm -hmm. Um, uh, people are downtrodden and there's only like uh, two classes the very very wealthy and rich who sometimes live in cities that are literally above everybody else yeah. and everybody else so very are, very clearly class oriented exactly. stuff everybody else yeah. is in the slum trading trying to get work earning a wage mm -hmm. trying to not end up on the street it's capitalism in the late late stages either that or mm -hmm. you get something like Star Trek where they yeah. um, attempt to imagine a world beyond capitalism. Um, but even in the lore of Star Trek, there was a point where humanity nearly wiped itself out, uh, just after the Eugenics yeah. Wars in, in the 90s that we apparently had. <laughs> oh, the famous Eugenic Wars? Oh, yeah. My yeah. father fought in those. Yeah, in the, in the trenches. Yeah, <laughs> in the trenches of the Eugenic Wars. So, yeah, yes, and it is very interesting because in many ways... If you uh, look at uh, art, right, and you look at the ways uh, people try to imagine the future, um, it's uh, very. It becomes very obvious that um, the w the future that people try to imagine in those uh, pieces of art is uh, an attempt of criticism of the our current condition, mm. right? And uh, for example, in those examples of clear class class divided uh, societies with the very rich and the very poor, uh, we could say we could, for example, use um, um, any cyberpunk novels, films, or games, right? Where you mm -hmm. have very strict class divisions, you have people inside and outside. You could have it's all um, um, an attempt to recognize the class antagonisms that we exist in today. Uh, but I believe that uh, the fact that 
um, Mark Fisher starts his book with a very similar movie, with a movie about the future, you know, science mm-hmm. fiction, you could say. Um, he used a very specific film, and uh, that film is actually um, the one that could it, show us how... Um, uh, basically explain what they, what do they mean when they say that the history is now dead mm. and that our world is not really creating history but is haunted by one and uh, that's th- the Alfonso Corazon's film Children of Men yes there's a very uh, mm-hmm. specific scene a very haunting scene where I believe the it's mentioned in the book the main character goes to see his I think it's his friend or a colleague yeah. uh, who lives high up in, in this mansion and it's actually like a converted museum and inside the museum mm-hmm. are different relics from the past like uh, the statue of David that's uh, they've, they've found pieces of it and they've put it back together and they have uh, the Mona Lisa and uh, I think some fan fiction Guernica had, yeah there yeah was Guernica like, uh, there. an old Atari console thing and like uh-huh. the question that the main character asks is um, who's going why collect all this stuff when no one else is going to enjoy it after us. Yeah, and for for people for people not knowing what the movie is about, children are not being born anymore. Yes, this right. is literally the last generation. There is like no children at all, so it's apocalypse basically. Yeah. It's and the apocalypse has already happened, and this is the 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 last years of humanity. Yeah, it's basically a forceful yeah. end of history, only in a sense that mm-hmm. more history can't be made. Yeah. And it's uh, the history it's has already ended when the last child was born. Basically, you know that's yeah. it. <laughs> this is a post-apocalyptic movie, you could even say. Hmm. So yeah, and uh, what did the what did the friend answer him with? The the friend ans- answered him with the nonchalant, oh, "I, I try not to think about it," and then immediately turns mm-hmm. and starts talking about a government-supplied suicide kit. <laughs> oh my god! It's pretty bleak. <laughs> Yeah, it is bleak, uh, and uh, yes, I th- exactly. I th- like, I think and the, uh, main, this, the, mm-hmm. the main things to take from this, uh, from the movie, and I think the book mentions it, is um, this is an apocalypse, apocalyptic situation, uh, well, a post-apocalyptic situation, that was uh, brought on by an imagining of there not being any more children being born, rather <laughs> than of capital and capitalism running its course it's well, a yeah. it's a weird mm-hmm. distinction where even when um, in a world where there's no point in making profit um, people are still trying to make profit <laughs> yeah the, for some no reason point. it still goes on because it's yeah. the mo- this the thing that drives actually the yeah. the world not only the in the reality making. of the film mm-hmm. but also the filmmakers and uh, I believe oh, the, the book writer well, huh. as well yeah. So the, um. And uh, could you please elaborate on that? Th- this is an interesting point. So the f- the filmmakers had a chance to expand mm-hmm. in the movie on the themes of anti-capitalism, yet they were still mm-hmm. stuck with the idea, um, mm-hmm. although endearingly, that um, the UK even in this crisis would still carry on. You know, you, you know, it would stiff up a lip, and on all that. <laughs> you know, don't yeah. don't. D- 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 just hold on, you know, still go to your jobs, mm-hmm. still earn a wage, pay rent, even though mm-hmm. in, like, a decade or two, everyone will be dead, and there'll be no, yeah. no one to pay rent to, let alone anyone to live in that house. And both in the reality well, yeah. of the film and the uh-huh. filmmakers can't quite see past capitalism. Even in mm-hmm. this film, people are still... Um, grasping onto what little amounts of profit they can get um, in the reality of the film and the filmmakers trying to make that into the film as well. Yeah. And I, th- and I well, think... Well, I believe uh, that that perfectly explains our condition. That's why I believe it's a perfect way to start such a book as uh, Capitalist Realism, hmm. isn't it? Like, yeah. uh, the same... It's very similar to our condition where we are facing, we're coming closer and closer to the ecological catastrophe that's not just like an apocalyptic event but rather an apocalyptic process that is already ongoing Mm. right, and uh, that uh, is going to destroy thousands and millions of livelihoods of people, uh, will create a whole class of climate refugees and will go on for 
hundreds of years. There is no way of coming. Like we already are fucked. Like and yeah. uh, we are. <laughs> yeah. so, it's it's a question of how much, right? Yeah. The, the and book, um, the book um, that we're talking about, Capital Realism, mm-hmm. really hits the point home when uh, what is happening in Children of Men is a very very slow process. The last yeah, the last exactly. child that was born um, in this universe is now uh, 18 or 19 so mm-hmm. it's been 19 years since the last person was born um, right and um, it's not as if it was a snap thing and then no baby's born it was probably mm-hmm. a very slow process of, of uh, um, the number of births for many decades going down and yeah. down and down and down and then the last person was born imagine the panic that people were going through. Imagine people thinking, no, it'll be fine. Imagine people thinking, mm-hmm. I'm not into this whole political thing, I'm just trying to earn a wage. And then mm-hmm. you get to where the film starts after years of backstory. It's a real um, portrait and picture and, and lens in which to view our real world. And uh, Cavern mm-hmm. Realism really tries to get us to do this because it's happening all around us. Um, yeah, senators in in the U.S. Congress don't understand that. No, we only have like ten years to solve climate change. Well, we have a plan for uh, fifteen years to begin to do something like. No, you don't understand. It's too yeah. late. Unless there's a problem that will kill us all within the next six months, nothing's going to be done. Mm-hmm. And then uh, unless and, yeah. unless and then the the book obviously continues. <laughs> yeah. And that's a very interesting thing because uh, basically for... Let's define some terms before yes. we go into. Capitalist realism, a very interesting term that was, wasn't coined by Mark Fisher but was precisely used for this particular purpose uh, for, by him and uh, is now widely expect, accept, accepted this particular term to have the meaning that he uh, gave it um, Give the meaning that he used for it. Mm. Uh, originally, it was a, like a satirical thing uh, by some artists, wh- where they basically used the socialist realism, you know, and put it and said, "Ah, capitalist realism," and they created art uh, using this term. But the way um, we might understand what Mark Fisher is talking about by is uh, by term postmodernism, mm. uh, not uh, postmodern condition. Uh, neoliberalism, neoliberal ideology, sniff sniff, <laughs> and uh, capitalist ideology, modern capitalist ideology, late capitalism, etc., etc. Hmm. And it basically describes a socio-economic condition, socio-economic, political, and ideological condition that we, us people living in 2019, have uh, experienced. The thing that we live in, you know, hmm. you might even say the society. <laughs> but uh, we live in a society. Bef- <laughs> before we go on a tangent to talk about that, hmm. um, basically, uh, I mean, the society that we live in, um, it, it's very, very important to understand that while uh, labeling all leftist postmodernists, right, uh, there are many uh, leftists, Marxists, like Mark Fisher is one of them, um, who understands and recognizes postmodern condition and uh, believes that it's not really good and that we should move past it. Uh, the same way, um, for example, Jordan Peterson is also a critic of postmodernity and capitalist realism to some extent, hmm. uh, because he also recognizes uh, the change that happened when we moved from Fordist way of organizing labor to post-Fordist organization of labor, when we moved from uh, when we moved into neoliberalism, and when we embraced neoliberal capitalism, when the modern uh, debt-based economies emerged, when the modern banking systems emerged, and um, it's all traced back to the 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. where this particular uh, way of organizing lives, basically, because I, nothing um, is apolitical. I, I, I uh, everything is interrelated. I did have yes, a quick please. question. Um, it's a side question. When uh, the the thing I've seen kicking around is the response to Jordan Peterson saying, um, "Oh, the postmodern Marxists and whatnot." The response is, um, uh, "Marxism actually rejects postmodernism." Is that true? Is that a an accurate response? Well, 
Marx in, is a, uh, you, you could say the following. Uh, uh, there is a clear distinction between postmodernist thinkers, postmodern thinker, postmodern philosophies, right? Because there's a difference between postmodern condition, postmodern uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, Foucault is a postmodernist, right? But he didn't support the things that, for example, Mark Fisher criticizes. Um, basically, what postmodernism as a philosophy is, as a philosophical um, concept, uh, it is a skepticism towards any big uh, narratives, you know, supra narratives. Uh -huh. And uh, examples of that is Marxism. Marxism is a super narrative. It's a narrative which says that, okay, this is what reality is. You have a capitalist class, you have the workers, they interact in a particular way, it's traced back in history, you have class relations there that were different, you see the bourgeoisie uh, as a lower class at one point, and the elites uh, and the property-owning uh, nobles above them, and there was a revolution, and the revolutionary class, the bourgeoisie, became the rule, blah, 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 blah. You have all this, you know, basically... Um, a theoretical framework that frames history in a particular way. And then postmodernists come and say, oh, wait a fucking second. Wouldn't you think that, uh, you know, f framing yourself around a particular um, big narratives is sort of wrong because um, those narratives are very subjective and the reality itself and how we experience it is very subjective. That's why they re they refused. They were critics of religion. They, uh, they some of them were leftists. A lot of them were leftists because mm -hmm. you couldn't say that Foucault was pro-capitalist in any way. He was the guy throwing bricks at, during 19 <laughs> Paris uh, events. You know, in the 60s, mm -hmm. he was throwing bricks at the cops, trying not to uh, put stains on his beautiful clothes, as uh, described by the eyewitnesses. Um, he was there, and all of them were there, but they still saw that there is a big problem with, with big narratives, be it religious, political, uh, left-wing, right-wing, doesn't really matter. Frankfurt School is all about criticizing those narratives, mm -hmm. and postmodern philosophy is all about criticizing those narratives and refusing them. Therefore, you could say that Marx is definitely not a postmodernist, because he was a modernist. Like, whole postmodernist uh, thought was built on criticism of uh, such narratives and such philosophies. Hmm. And they are part of the, uh, you know, of the intellectual evolution. And um, it doesn't mean that everything that Marx said is wrong. It means that they are uh, n not in the same school of thought, you know? Because he was a modernist. He was a, he was a modernist thinker. Hmm. Just as, for example, Freud is and uh, other people that were uh, at the time writing the, uh, in the same vein as Marx, uh, they were part of the different schools. So it is sort of correct to say that he wasn't really postmodernist. Hmm. He wasn't. Definitely wasn't. Okay. But uh, in the similar <laughs> way to how... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I went on a bit of a tangent, but I can jump off back from this. The same way postmodern thinkers said that... Um, those big narratives uh, sh are bollocks and shouldn't exist. Uh, and the god was killed in the fury of, uh, of, of logic and reason and uh, uh, YouTube atheists. Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, we have this emptiness mm -hmm. that the god used to possess. And what this emptiness uh, creates, it creates a, necess a necessity for some structure. And the capitalist realism is one of those structures that emerged. Is the condition is is the structure that exists now, um, in place of all of those big narratives? Because if you could say, if you could ask people about ideologies, the word ideology usually means um, this very alien, uh, well-structured uh, thing, right? Mm, and you could the when you say of ideology, the compass. Uh, or even the past, you know, that's mm. the past, you know. This is when Stalin uh, ideology, yes, Marxism ideology, you know, capitalism not an ideology all of a sudden. Mm. Liberalism, not an ideology. And that's why some people are saying that we live in a, in a very important place in history, in a, in a place of history where history ceased to exist, where we don't really create history anymore because we live in a post-ideological Fukuyamaist world. 
mm. where social this, this... democratic capitalism is it. Nothing mm. was going to change anymore. Fukuyama was uh, mentioned in the book as well, I believe. Mm -hmm. if I yeah, remember. because he he was one of those guys who said the end of history, and mm. to some extent he's correct, because um, people who try to imagine the world beyond capitalism, who try to imagine the world, be any world beyond our current uh, condition, is seen as dangerous radicals and extremists mm. who should be suppressed because they are dangerous. Sometimes in a way as well, uh, it, when people try to imagine a positive outlook beyond uh, mm -hmm. capitalism, they're called idealists, and they're, uh, they're, yes. they're often a fantasy Utopians. world, it's all faffy, it'll never happen, how could this be achieved? Yeah, uh, again, exactly. Again, again, with Star Trek, um, uh, a lot, lots of people, especially people on the right, will say, um, mm -hmm. oh yeah, Star Trek, that's, that's a, a libertarian uh, ANCAP dream, I'm like, what? What? <laughs> they they just cannot see a future without profit and and private property. Without money. Without yes, money. Without yeah. private property. Without so they, money. Yeah. It's a moneyless society outright. It means yeah. that it's it's uh, it's a need based economy with full automation. Hmm. That's literal actual existing communism. You know, <laughs> that's they, the communist society. Yeah, and they still try to uh, tack on and apply. Uh, um, uh, oh no! But they trade with the Ferengi, which means they're capitalists. Oh no! They um they have property. They have a house. That's that's private property. Yeah, and, you know, un not understanding definitions of private mm -hmm. and personal property again. Like yeah, sure. <sighs> mm -hmm. and, and it's not just Star Trek. Um, you you get this with a lot of different media, and um, I think uh, because it's really impossible to imagine. That's yeah. again uh, for people. Who, tr who live, like, it's really hard for any person who actually lives in today's world to try to uh, look beyond uh, the conditions uh, of our, uh, our current conditions. Mm. And the current conditions specifically are designed to look as if that's it. As if mm. this is it, we have done it, history's ended, politics are done, uh, we'll just have management and we'll have the state managing some of the things and the market uh, will be finally free from the state and this utopian dream of uh, a neoliberalism mm. that will just save everyone from uh, bureaucracy of the past and will save us from um, discontent and uh, poverty and will provide us with all the good things. That's the real, in my opinion, utopianism. <laughs> That's the real utopianism, and uh, yeah. I think, uh, uh, in many I ways we see this utopianism failing more and more in uh, today's world. Hmm. There's there's a real uh, people think a lot of uh, people, especially younger people, um, mm -hmm. even mentioned in the in, in the book as well. Uh, they wrongly say that there's a that there's this apathetic feeling that. Uh, um, this mm -hmm. is the world around us. That's how it's going to be forever. We might as well not try to change anything. And I think the thing right. to remember is that they're not apathetic. They're just bored. They don't know that they can mm -hmm. change. Uh, we can, you know, we can change the world around us for the better. Yeah. There is a world beyond capitalism. We just have to work for it. Uh, actually, before we started, you made a very clear distinction. You talked about it a bit. You made a clear distinction between apathy and boredom. Yes. Can you please uh, tell us what's so, the difference between those terms, in your opinion? So apathy is a state of not caring. You know that the world could be changed, but uh, I just don't want to. I'm happy just where I am. Boredom mm -hmm. is where people uh, can be roused from their boredom. They can be shown that the world can change, and then people will go, oh, oh, this is how we do it. Okay, this is exciting. Mm -hmm. I have options. There are things I can do to improve the world around me. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work with an apathetic person. You go to an apathetic person and say, hey, we could fix your house from not being on fire. And they go, I don't care. <laughs> but okay. you go to a person uh -huh. who's staring at the house thinking, my God, there's nothing I can do now. God, I'm so... I'm so bored of options. My house is on fire, and you are fine. Yeah, but the boredom is very similar to that because it's literally like you just can't do anything and you feel yeah. helpless. Yeah, and if you, you don't if you do come anything. in as a fireman yeah. and you put out that fire mm -hmm. and you say here take this auxiliary hose and help me you're showing them hey there is something you can do there is a new world to build a new you know we can save your house from being on fire i'm sort of mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm bringing up philosophy tubes um 
fireman starting fires thing. And oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, <laughs> the 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 analogies were about to collide, and I sort of had to stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I can. I, it's a very interesting distinction between because the way actually Mark Fisher described the condition because he was a practicing professor. He he worked as a professor, and he worked with a lot of young people. Into uh, and uh, he described this particular very particular depression that a lot of those young people have. And that it wasn't depression, you know, apathetic depression, you could say. It was a, uh, it was boredom. It wasn't impossibility mm. to gain pleasure, as he wrote it in the book itself, but an impossibility to get anything but pleasure. So you had to be hooked onto the consumption of media. You had to, you have to be hooked on the consumption of uh, positive, uh, you know, um, positive reinforcement and positive. Uh, flashing things in your face, you know, so that you would be distracted from maybe yourself to some extent. Mm. And um, yeah, there was. Um, he saw that. There yeah, was, there was a situation please. with a specific student uh, in the book. Oh, where the, I remember. Yeah, with the headphones, where yeah, one, yeah, yeah. In Could one you class, please tell they had us? the headphones on with no music, but then in mm -hmm. another class, they had the headphones down and playing music out of them. And in both instances, mm -hmm. very, uh, very, very low volume at the same time. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not so mm -hmm. much that they wanted to um, intake music to comfort them; they wanted to know that their headphones were close to them and that it worked. So this, yeah. uh, this, you are always next to the machine that will provide you with, uh, you know, entertainment and positivity. You exactly. can always consume. Consumption is always near. Mm. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's to some a, extent, an, it, yeah, yeah it's a it's an interesting little microcosm um, mm -hmm. of how lots of people uh, felt at that time and even today. Because I believe the book was written in two thousand and nine. Yes, two thousand and nine, yeah. and uh, a lot has changed since I believe, and uh, uh, so, a lot has changed in terms of how uh, we respond to the conditions that we exist in. A lot mm. has changed to in our response to capitalist realism, uh, partially thanks to uh, the work of many, many uh, leftists who became very popular in that time span. You could say Slavoj Žižek pay, uh, had a lot to do with how many young intellectuals and young people in general uh, perceive their state, you know, because uh, we can see that today um, the sort of democratic socialism is a term that is fucking trending, right, all, all around the world, and mm -hmm. we can, uh, with the Western world at least, and you can see that a lot of young people are getting more and more engaged in the political process by the one way or another, and uh, most of them are looking to the left, and mm -hmm. um, it's happening, uh, in my opinion, due to the fact that uh, I don't think that all of them recognize what capitalism even is, still to this day. I don't think that many of the people who vote for Bernie Sanders in America or support Jeremy Corbyn are conscious of class antagonisms and how they are part of the system. Mm. Uh, I don't think they're conscious of postmodern conditions are either. But what they are doing is that they are reacting to capitalist realism. They are reacting to... Um, to it the way they see how, to, in the only way they can see how, they look at the people who are coming to them and telling them, okay, healthcare and education are things that shape in your lives. Those things should be free, right? Those mm. are things that are universal. Those are the things that you should, we should all be supportive of. And uh, they are looking at their conditions. They're looking at the, condi uh, the past generations. They understand that uh, debt is not really a fun thing to have for 20 or 30 years. Mm. And uh, just to get a job at Starbucks, it reminds me of a very interesting anecdote that um, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Wolf uh, told um, at one of his interviews where he was at his local Starbucks outside of his home in New York City. And uh, a girl came to the counter and asked to fill in the form, application form for a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was asked by the manager, do you have a bachelor's degree? And her response was, I don't. And uh, I must say, a bachelor's degree to work in a, in a, in a coffee shop. Yeah. And uh, 
She uh, said no, and he said, I will still give you the form, but you should understand that our management gives priority to people with higher education. And uh, that's it. You must have a higher education to get any job. And um, therefore, the debt is the way to go. People, young people see that thing. They, they live through that thing. And they are saying, no, we don't want, to, we don't want that. Hmm. That's why I believe that a lot of young people are still part of the whole thing. They're still a part of this. They're still depressed hmm. in the way that Mark Fisher uh, told them. And no. a lot of them are depressed, yeah. literally. No, it's, it's, it is but anecdotal. But they try to move. They try to do something. Yeah, yeah. It is anecdotal because it's, it's just people I've asked. And um, mm -hmm. I will admit that. Uh, a lot of my friends are saying um, they were excited about a course at, say, La Trobe or uh, Swans... Swanston, Swanston University or University of Sydney mm -hmm. and and they looked at the, the career path afterwards and said okay, I can either work at McDonald's now or I can work at McDonald's with a degree in urban planning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? Well, I need to pay rent so it's McDonald's for now. It's, yeah. it's this weird false quasi um educational option that uh, mm -hmm. has people trapped within this capitalist realist yeah. system Mark Fisher told a very similar thing about postgraduate students mm, yeah. like you can get your bachelor's degree and you can work get a position in McDonald's or you can spend um, without no with, with no aspirations of scientific work you can go into postgraduate stu uh, postgraduate studies right and um, spend some more years in the university and then go to do a McDonald's job and many people choose to go to be to become undergraduate students hmm. because for them this is an environment that is understandable for them there is uh, it, it's at least something right it's at least something uh, it's not McDonald's jobs and they do those things uh, and with no aspirations to do any scientific work and uh, in many ways uh, we can see very very similar patterns of behavior seen across uh, not only in education and not only with young people, we can see it around the world, at uh, around uh, different spheres of uh, social life and political life. Uh, we see uh, politicians saying uh, phrases like, there is no alternative, uh, that these are the things, this is how the things are going to be forever, you know, f basically implying that. While failing to recognize that if you proposed similar things like utter privatization of healthcare and education and you would propose that in the beginning of the 20th century or even in the 50s you would be looked at as a madman hmm. because those things were impossible at one point at one point those things were utterly utterly impossible and for some reason in the 70s it became possible and now we we sort of do that now great you know the same thing with uh, any sort of revolution. It's always impossible. It's always impossible until it, the day after it happens. Mm. And then it was possible all along. And uh, we should understand that uh, change is always possible. Change is always possible because... Um, change is happening. How did it come about? Co yeah. Change is happening Please. all around us, but it's up to us, the mm -hmm. workers and the comrades to steer these changes towards the betterment of society and the workers around the world. If we sit back and do nothing and just wait for the revolution to happen, then the fascists have already won. Then they're going to take over. They're going to make the changes they need to take over and to start you know, just yeah. destroying the world. So it's up to us. Basically. It's up to us to put in the work to make the changes necessary to steer us towards a better world that we can build together. A world beyond capitalism and this capitalist realism that's uh, currently uh, gripping us around the metaphorical throat. Yeah, and we can we will talk about uh, how do we overcome it, um, and about some other interesting aspects of the book uh, in the second part of the show. And for now, we shall go into the intermission. We will be right back after these messages. And this is the intermission. So we are supported by our 
very good fans that are so generous to give us the communist dollars. And we are very, very glad for all of you to send in us all the, your communist dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, don't forget that you can support our show by going to patreon.com slash eml podcast and you can spend some money on us or go to our Kofi page in the description to do the same if you want to do just like a one-off thing uh, we are basically existing because of two things one people giving us money two people sharing our stuff in your spaces in your le favorite leftist groups uh, discord servers and chats so um, if you like what we're doing and you want to support it, you can do give us money or just share us around. Give likes to the videos so that we will be uh, better in terms of SEO. Leave comments um, like any old comment will do. Uh, just don't be a Nazi guy who literally <laughs> left a comment uh, like uh, yesterday on on the shit posting video that we did about Trump. Uh, don't be that guy. Please don't post Nazi propaganda shit on our videos. Thank you. <laughs> and today, we would like to congratulate, uh, like, I congratulate all of you people who uh, succeeded in not leaving Nazi comments on our videos and at the same time giving us money. And I would like to thank a bowl of creamy tomato soup, Comrade Gultsov, a new boy, Big Guy Liam. Hey. Ow, yeah, Big Guy Liam, what up? Dabbing on him. The Proletariat and Molten Keep. Thank you so very much for giving us all of your communist dollars. Uh, we are very, very uh, glad that you exist. You're keeping the lights in this uh, hellish place. And uh, due to your support, we will grow even better uh, as the months and days go by. So, yeah, thank you. And also, don't forget that we have an Instagram, like, EML Instagram page, which is, I believe, on par with regular content uh, now, because I have got my shit together and there's a tons of tons of shit there. It's Instagram.com slash ReSoviet, where we post some very good socialist and uh, Soviet visuals, photos, uh, art, uh, Soviet art, a lot of it. <laughs> Yes, uh, there is a lot of a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, so please follow it. It's not your, you know, general, you know, oh, people posting hammers and sickles all the time. We have a lot of like interesting uh, Soviet art from the 70s, 60s, uh, even 90s and 80s from like all throughout the ages and. Uh, um, you can find some interesting, uh, visually appealing stuff there, and uh, even some thought-provoking art, and some very cool pictures. The last thing I posted was uh, an image of the Bolshoi Theater in Mo in Moscow, decorated for the 70th year anniversary of the uh, October Revolution, mm -hmm. and that's a sign to fucking see. So check it out. Uh, and yeah, Tiki, do you have anything else to announce? Yes, I have a uh, a new Twitter handle. You can tweet me at. I've forgotten it. <laughs> At EMLTK Jones on Twitter. With no underscores. No, no, no more Trump, underscores. the real thing. <laughs> Before people were getting confused and asking, like, do I write the words underscore or just the symbol? Like, nope. Gonna solve that problem now. Uh, on Twitter, it is at EMLTK Jones. Yeah, you can follow uh, him there. Also, don't forget to follow Dimp Dab, follow Manman Massive, who is, uh, by the way, full member of the Email Collective by now, uh, who's also a frequent contributor to Zero Books, and uh, he is the editor of this thing. Mm. He edits our shit now, and we applaud him for all of his time and dedication and his labor, uh, and uh, no, th we're not going to pay you. T please work more. Yes, very good. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um... We, we we are very bad in terms of like social uh, social package that we <laughs> give to our, to our workers. Very terrible. No dental. Uh, so no no, I haven't seen a dentist in like five years. I think. <laughs> uh, and with that, uh, with this horrifying image of my mouth in your mind, uh, let us go into the music break, and we'll see you after that with more capitalist realism. <laughs>
And we are back after the music break. Uh, you can send all of your correspondence, by the way, including your own music, if you want to feature it in our episodes, uh, at, uh, at our email address, emlpodcast at gmail.com. So, TK, um, let's go back to talk about some more capitalist realism. Mm. And I believe that it's a very, very interesting thing that we failed to cover in the first part, which I think is very, very important, is this d- delusional, delusional claim uh, that uh, modern capitalism has destroyed bureaucracy. Mm. And that bureaucracy is a thing that the Stalinists do, and uh, it's, a, it's a Soviet Union thing, and uh, the, or the old capitalist thing. Nowadays, uh, the market forces uh, direct everything. And f- thankfully, finally, we are free you know, from it all. Mm. Uh, Mark Fisher used a term which haunts me in my dreams. And uh, he refers to the current new bureaucracy as market Stalinism. Oh boy. That term alone <laughs> <laughs> is something that I'm like, oh my god, what the fuck? Like, it, it's just so powerful. I love it. So, yeah, market Stalinism. What we fail to recognize, what a lot of liberals fail to recognize, is that capitalism is not really non-bureaucratic. Because we like to think about exchange and market, right? And forces and invisible hands and privatization and the liberation of the bureaucracy of the state, mm. you know, and emergence into the b- running it like business, uh, literally of, or literally by privatizing it or by restructuring the essential things like healthcare, medicine, you know, healthcare, education, uh, public services as businesses, right? Um, we failed to remember that the unit, the economic unit of capitalism, is not a market transaction. Hmm. It's a firm. It's a business. It's a corporation. Be it small or, or, or big, you know, it's a firm. And those firms are bureaucracy, bu- bureaucratic, extremely so. And... Uh, as Mark Fisher showed in his examples when he brought up uh, university and um, uh, brought up university specifically, uh, because uh, I believe postgraduate universities, further education universities mm. um, in Britain, those things don't really work well in markets. Because uh, when you do education or healthcare, um, it really doesn't work that well in these, you know, commodity... Uh, yeah. Um, s- s- commodity... It doesn't work as a commodity very well. Yeah, well, wasn't You know, it doesn't work as a service very well. Wasn't the book even questioning, like, uh, what is the product in education? Is it the education <laughs> yeah. that's offered, or is it the student that's the commodity? Yeah, exactly. And those things are... And, and you know what? There is no clear answer to that. Mm. Because... Like, uh, if you are paying for a service, you are the person who is, uh, from how liberals tell us, uh, you're all, like, basically, like, capitalist logic tells us, in capitalism, if you pay someone your money, means you're in control, right? You are the guy who came there and said, I want a hamburger, right? And you pay your dollar for a hamburger and get your hamburger. Hmm. And it's bad. It doesn't have pickles in it. And you're like, well... Let me see your manager. Where are the fucking pickles? And they apologize and they give you a good pickle free, pick, pickle, f- pickle full, you may say, hamburger. Right? You paid for a thing and you didn't get what you wanted, so you still have power in this relationship, right? Because it's about your money. In education, it's not really like that. You can't tell your professor, hey, professor, teach us this thing, or uh, I don't like how you teach, right? Uh, please do this or that. You're not really in control there. Could you, right? could you slow down and not rub, rub off all the stuff you've just written on the board? I haven't finished copying it down yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are, there are no contractual obligations in this exchange. Hmm. It's not a direct exchange. There are both sides in this thing, right? The, the university does depend on you paying money, mm. but at the same time, you're not really in control because you are under the uh, structures of the university education where the professors and the management of the university are in control of your uh, education life, you know, and your, sometimes your life in general, if, especially if you live in the campus, right? Mm. Uh, it's sort of very, very weird. It doesn't really work well in markets, right? 
For example, one, uh, like it's, it, it's, it, people like to imagine that it's, oh, it's a service, right? You have a contract, it's a service. And from the capitalist standpoint, they're correct. Those things are services. If you pay for education, they're providing you with a service. But in my personal experience and the experience of many people who did university, it's not really like, for example, going to uh, a, a hairdresser and getting your hair done, right? Mm. Both things are services, don't really work in the same way. Therefore, um, to combat this impossibility of a university to be like a business, um, the bureaucratization processes have been invading those spaces for a very, very long time, since the 60s, basically, since the 80s, basically. And um, we see that in in the West, and here actually the same in Belarus. It's also doing that. It started with school education, bureaucratization of the school education, and uh, it slowly and slowly moves into universities. Universities, it works basically almost exactly like uh, Mark Fisher explained, because of the semi-private uh, way universities are run in my country. Because mm -hmm. we do have private education, but our education is mostly, most of the universities are state-controlled, state-owned. Uh, but they operate on uh, the paid basis. And university that doesn't get any funding from the government and can pay for itself with tuition fees has an interest to maintain that and to maximize their profits because of the reports given to the Ministry of Education. You know, it's the same way with any government controlled businesses. They still have a profit incentive mm. because government, today's governments, states see uh, any services, they want to run the services as businesses. For mm. them, um, a year in profits uh, in this particular like organization, gov state organization, is seen as a, as a positive thing because market incentivizes us to think that way. If something gets you money, it's good, right? And that logic applies to the big things and to the small things. For example, um, Tiki, do you have any hobbies? I have a few. Nerf for one. Like for example, one. Nerf. Great example. Does it pay? Does it, does your hobby provide you with any income? No, it costs money. It costs me a butt ton of money sometimes. Yeah, wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you see that in many ways, hobbies which could be mon which are monetizable, are seen as far better than hobbies that are not monetizable. Mm. Like for example, people who obsess over a thing, right, and spend tons of money on it, right, and do tons of be it nerf, uh, be it uh, medieval, uh, you know, sword fighting reenactments. Sports, they are seen as delusions in many ways. People who are doing it are delusional. They are spending all that money, right? But the person who does photography with the same passion as a person who is doing historical reenactment, for example, uh, is seen as a person who is uh, far more entrepreneurial and better, you know, because they can monetize their income. They can mm. monetize their hobbies. And, um, uh, for example, people don't really treat that thing serious that we do, right? Until I mention, oh yeah, it pays for itself. We are we're profiting from it. Very little, but profiting. That's a phrase I use. And I like to see how they change with their faces. I talk about politics on the internet, but it gives me profit. It's mm. all of a sudden they switch. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, interesting. Uh, it's, because it's got this, market it's necessitates got this that. Weird, uh, this weird paternal thing where it's, mm -hmm. it's, like, uh, it's like when I try to say to my mom, even... Like, yeah. oh, well, what, what do you do all, all this time talking to your mates on the internet? I'm like, well, we have a podcast and we do a show, and, and her eyes light, and it's like, oh, really? Like, And, and we're like, yeah, we're, we're supported mm -hmm. by Patreon. Like, oh, really? It's like, yeah, we only get like mm -hmm. $20 a month. And then I see this brightness in her eyes just droop and as, as if she's thinking, oh, it's not an income, it's a hobby. Oh, yeah. Well, what's the it's point? It's a hobby, then? it's not an income, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing oh. with, uh, for example, the success of EML is determined more in the eyes of the public or our friends, you know, by how much money we get and not how many interesting conversations we had, mm. how many interesting people we had, or, on, you know, what by, sort of by fun how many viral hits we had. Yeah, by how many subscribers we have. Um, mm hmm. 
only in terms of how many views, therefore how much money we get from advertising. Yeah, only in terms of monetization. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a thing that is visible in many aspects of life. Um, and in our... Like, nobody fucking cares that I had an interview with uh, Paul Cockshot, you know? And we had a very interesting... He explained some of the things from his books. That means nothing, right? Nothing to people. And uh, no, because it doesn't pay, it doesn't provide us with any sort of income. Hmm. Uh, but we see that all all over the thing because market invaded, invaded our spaces. It tries to invade uh, the places which um, are unquantifiable. You can't really count how much fun you have, hmm. right? Therefore, your fun is not really important. Uh, you can't really count how much. Um, you know how much f f f time you spend with your friends. What you can count, what you can count, is how much your clothes w uh, cost. Hmm. You know, would you because it's comparative. Say, would you say, uh, as an example of commoditization, right? Would you say mm -hmm. the commoditization of YouTube killed off more creative YouTube channels for the ones that were uh, instead of the ones that were able to stick to the trends and get views and no you know. no i don't think so i don't think so because uh if you look at early youtube before monetization um it did have uh, a lot of like um a lot of weird shit <laughs> weird yeah. shit sort of uh, goes away more and more today but in my opinion it's uh, mostly like youtube originally was made to be monetized Mm. And uh, therefore, uh, this platform overall does not really um, n provide you with this, you know, itch for weirdness. And okay. uh, again, weirdness is a is a thing that easily is a easily appropriated by the system. Mm. Like, look at the biggest big big boys nowadays. Like, look at, for example, um, let's say, um, Filthy Frank. To some I was, extent, I was just about to say, Filthy Frank. He was yeah. weird. Yes, he was weird, blah, 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 but uh, he was extremely popular, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, and he got a lot of money from doing that, and, and then he went on to do other things. On the basis of that, he jumped off and started doing music, right? Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with Poppy. Poppy is weird, right? But she is really fucking big. And uh, it's weird, yes, it's, criti it's critical of the, uh, you could say, culture industry, as a donor would put it, right? But again, she gets a lot of money from doing that, right? There is a monetary incentive to do weird things. The same with anti-capitalist movies, like a Lego movie, right? Lego movie is an anti-capitalist movie where an evil corporation are the baddies. Doesn't really Octane. matter. Doesn't matter. Book ten makes everything. It doesn't matter. The same with Wally -E and all media, all yes. machines. And the same with uh, uh, Wally -E, uh, and the, uh, the movie that was brought up by Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher in his book. Mm. An mm. evil corporation destroyed the planet, <laughs> and then humanity was enslaved physically and mentally by them on the outer space ship. Oh, no, no. They were freed from the Earth that they destroyed <laughs> and put on these ships. Well, basically no, just no, 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 no. Smaller versions no. of the oppression that they In were the under. ideology of the movie, those are the bad guys and those are bad things. Despite the fact that it's a <laughs> capitalist product, which uh, mm. didn't really do any critical, like, assertion why we fucked up, it, it sort of, like, basically removed the bad ideology of the corporation that is portrayed by the autopilot, we defeated that thing, mm. and now we are liberated, right? Like, the same thing mm. with uh, V for Vendetta. Evil, oppressive, fascist regime, we defeated it, great, what now? There is, uh, like, fun, uh. right? It's, it's all those bad guys, you know, that we are defeating, and then putting good people in place of them, no, it doesn't work like that, because if, it, if you have, if you take uh, a puppy of a person, right, and put this person at the, at the pedestal of the owner of fucking, like, of a uh, um, generic evil corp, this person will mm. be either, will become an evil person, or will go out of business, because they have to do evil shit. Yeah, I think I think that's the main thing to, in a broader sense, uh, criticism mm -hmm. of capitalism is that no matter who's in charge of it, it will always be capitalism. Yeah, you could have the 
brightest, the smartest, the kindest, the most caring people in charge of all the different businesses in all of the capitalist world, which we, you know, which is the real yeah. world, the society that we live in. Amen. And they would, st- yeah, they would still do all of the bad things that we Marxists and socialists and communists say will happen, because in order to be successful in capitalism you have to compete against other companies you have to make a profit Mm -hmm. and you have to exploit workers exactly no matter who's in charge doing it the exploitation is there yeah and and do you think that's what uh the book was trying to get at uh yes obviously because um uh, what capitalist realism ultimately is is uh uh like what it does with us it prevents us from a critical um critical approach to our lives because to have a critical approach to our lives will mean that you want to imagine something beyond that which means that you are an ideologically motivated uh, utopian which will uh, do the genocide on the gamers and what will we do without the gamers (laughs) right and uh, you're dangerous and you shouldn't have access to any of the things blah 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 like fuck off Um, recognizing that such things that are obvious to us, like property rights, land ownership, um, such things as, uh, um, let's say, prisons, you know, and crime, mental health, Mm. even, as uh, Mark Fisher wrote extensively about uh, in this book and beyond, those things are politically constructed, those things are politically motivated and politically perpetuated. Like, the, the mm. idea that something is apolitical is the most politicized thing that one person could say in 2019. Because saying that you're not, uh, you're not really political or you're apolitical would mean that you are completely, in, like, absorbed by the ruling ideology. Because, I'm sorry, but it's, it may sound crazy, but... The world is political. People exist in the frameworks created by politics. Capitalism is political. It's not neutral. It's a poli- being pro-capitalist is a political stance, and that's a thing that we leftists should reinforce. Because, hmm. and it's all right if the person says, "Well, well, you know what? I am pro-capitalist. Then fuck off, you call me." Fuck off. I'm a capitalist. Fuck off. You know what? I believe that the person who is making jokes about um, Pinochet and uh, helicopters is far less dangerous to us as leftists and us as workers as a person who says, well, you know, no, they're not really political. I don't think that uh, Mm. politics don't... uh, Not even, you know, I'm not that political. You know, we're not talking about a bored person. We're talking about the apathetical person, right? Is the term that you used, right? Mm. Uh, We're talking about the person who sees all of the things and doesn't recognize the politics in it. We're talking about the person uh, that has enough privilege to ignore, right? Because it's easy to be not really that political when you live in a comfort, when you lead a comfortable life, having a comfortable job. Uh, in the first world, and uh, enjoying, you know, insane amounts of fucking money that you get from a middle manager position somewhere in New York, right? And uh, just then say, yeah, you know, I don't really, yeah, I'm really, it's a real shame that, you know, uh, black people are getting murdered. It's a real shame, but, you know, I'm not really that political, you know? It's a shame that we are literally putting up, they're putting up the fucking suicide nets up uh, in China. That the healthcare, mm. that the depression is an epidemic of the twi- late 20th century and the early 21st century. is an epidemic of late capitalism. is a political thing, mm. depression is. Those things are skyrocketing nowadays. Due to mm. our emotional response to the fucking world that we exist in. Like, that's the thing. We all... Uh, no, that's all about individuals. It's all about... Uh, it's not political, it's not, uh, no, 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 bad, th- bad thoughts go away, right? Any Anybody who comes up to you and says, 
um, oh, you know, I'm I'm apolitical. They have an agenda. They do. Or either they, they are used oh, by I'm the not people with the agenda. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not political at all. They're very political. They are. In they, many ways. They will have opinions that are political. But they sometimes, <laughs> honestly, don't see that as political opinions. Mm. Because when pressed, all of a sudden you can hear a person being expressing ideological opinions, which are ideologically, philosophically motivated. Those, this is politics. Mm. This is politics. Some, sometimes as well, you got to remember that someone will say that they're not political mm-hmm. and then say, God damn, I'm so oppressed at work, I wish there was something I could do. Yeah. Sometimes these apolitic, these people who think they're apolitical are potential comrades. In many ways, yes. All of them are. Like, that's the whole thing. Uh, I d- we must recognize that the issues of late capitalism are not ideology-based. They are class-based, mm. And they are, in many ways, universal. Just mm. as Marx wrote uh, in, uh, in his times, the bourgeois class exists in the class restrictions that are imposed on them by capital. Bourgeoisie mm. uh, also exists under capitalism. It's not that, oh, when you break off into the bourgeois class, you're liberated, finally. Of course, you, you become the exploiter. Right, but you not mm. liberate it, like because it still exists. You have to exploit to survive. You, you're exploiting still. to survive. You have to uh, lead your life in a particular way. You, you know, especially with late capitalism, where everything's solid. As a very interesting phrase that uh, there is so much in this fucking book, people. Like it's how long is it? It's like hundred pages or so. It's 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 around hundred pages, right? And there is so much there. Hmm. For example, how uh, Mark Fisher said that everything solid boils down into PR in late capitalism. It doesn't really matter how what you produce and how you produce it. It matters how it how it is goes well in terms of PR. That's the thing that's important. You hmm. know, I work for I'm example. I'm imagining a, a greasy yeah. greasy car salesman coming up to you, mm-hmm. selling you an absolute shit box, but making it sound like a Lamborghini. <laughs> in many ways, like for example. <laughs> I work uh, as a... I have a new job as a technical support guy. I work in technical support of a company that produces... uh, that makes a product, right? They produce a product Mm -hmm. and they sell it on the market and I'm the guy who who they message when something doesn't work. And uh, an interesting thing that I observed and uh, my colleagues observed is that uh, the people don't really fucking give a fuck about technical support guys. You know, they don't really give give a fuck about us. We are the uh, prancing mm-hmm. monkeys that have no expertise in coding or manufacturing or anything like that. We are the people who get the shit from everyone, the customers and the colleagues. And uh, because they don't really... The, the only thing, the only role that we fulfill is PR. The only role that we fulfill mm-hmm. is that we, uh, our task is not really to solve the problems of the customers, but to show uh, to the people who are purchasing us that, oh, we have 24 7 technical support, and we, our main task is PR, ultimately. It's marketing. The main task of the, we, us is marketing. The main task of people who are doing the interfaces, for example, for applications on your phone, is not really to make it comfortable for you, it's to make PR for the company. Or, uh, mm. and partially, of course, we are doing some labor, which is productive, right? But yeah. the late capitalism tries to, it's a process of everything going back to PR and everything being about PR. Because stock prices are not really, you know, affected by how uh, well the product that was produced was received by an individual. It's a PR thing. Mm-hmm. It's a marketing thing. It's a, uh, um, you and know... W- yeah. Workers around the world are told, you're the face of the company. Yeah. You're not. Be in the back room. <laughs> yeah. Don't talk to anyone when you leave t- to go to your car. Yes. Don't post about us on Facebook. Don't do... Don't mention anything about the But you're the face of the you're company. The face, you're the face of the company. You're the face of the, of the brand. You're the brand uh, representative. But you're actually a salesperson. That's what they call now the yeah. people who work in concept stores or like in brand stores, right? They're now brand representatives. Mm. You know, or brand uh, ambassadors. There's a, there's, you a know? New, there's a strange level of bureaucracy to it where your job title just gets longer and bigger and you get less and less. Yeah, paid. for some reason. 
yeah. <laughs> oh my god yeah oh my god the book is good people i liked it did you like the book mm. tk in general I, I i liked the book um it it got a little to me it got a little convoluted with how many different references there were mm-hmm. but it's merely setting up the dominoes yeah for the big crescendo at the end it really gets the conclusion good at the yeah. end and um let's talk a bit about um overcoming let's say we we've talked a bit about how the young people are waking up nowadays right and how they're recognizing how mm. our condition is really fucked up uh or they they oh, don't yeah. really recognize I, I had it a friend. they don't even recognize it but they feel that and they're like oh no i uh. i had a friend i kid you not mm-hmm. like at the uh last month at the start of last month right they were like I don't know, man. I don't know if socialism or even communism can work because, you know, the regular on human nature, this and that. Mm-hmm. And then just recently, this month, uh, I kid you not, like yes- yesterday, he's like, you know, I understand why people are realizing the class that they're in and they're sort of growing in their consciousness <laughs> as to how fucked the world is. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> oh Holy my God. shit. <laughs> That's a, such a like, big thing. Even, to... okay. Yeah, okay. even on his own. Even on his own, he's suddenly seen how fucked he is because of his class. Yeah. Because he is a worker, and the workers are getting fucked over. And no matter how hard he worked at whichever job that he works, mm-hmm. he was never going to reach the to the level of richness that his boss was. Exactly. Because <laughs> his, his boss makes billions of dollars. Oh my god. And my friend made very little. And it was just in the span of just a month that he's like... Oh, I don't know about communism, and then all of a sudden, fuck capitalism, fuck it to death. We got to do something about it now. <laughs> yeah, my guy. It's and, amazing. Uh, the way, um, like the actually, we could have a even a two-parter, you know, on this one. Do you think we should make it a two-parter? Because I think there's uh, this is a good jumping-off point to start talking about the growing class consciousness and what we can to to help guide it. Yeah, yeah, because in many ways, um, like the way the management, the way the companies work in the so-called post-Fordist era, right, in the late capitalism mm-hmm. and capitalist realism, is very different, and uh, is very much the same in terms of oppression, and even worse in terms of oppression. It's m- more brutal than ever. And the the friendly, yeah, with a with a fucking friendly face, and um, like for example, I work in the same office space as the co-owner of the company, who is uh, like he he earns I don't know how much he earns, but he is a fucking like, rich as fuck. I'm pretty sure, because <laughs> our company is exploding in terms of sales, is exploding in terms of growth. Right? For like, we are opening offices globally, right? We are a global mm-hmm. company that grew from a startup into the big thing, right? And the dude is very, very rich, I must think, right? <laughs> and um, he interviews every single person who's hired by a Belarusian office. He talks to them and he asks, like, yeah, what's, what's like you'll enjoy very much in life? Like, tell me, what do you like a lot, right? And you sit there, it's like, Man, getting almost twice the amount of pay at this position that my previous position, that's what gets me rolling up, like, yay, let's work, right? <laughs> and it's like, you're paying tons of fucking cash for, like, good work, that's why I want to work here. <laughs> like, and he's like, what's that getting you like that? And I try, I, I, you try to come up with some bullshit answer, but like, oh, I like talking to people and solving the problems, and I really like, you know, getting into integrity of technology, and I really enjoy that. And you start saying some utter oh, bullshit bullshit to that guy who earns it's, it's millions that, it's I think I think millions of dollars every year right and then he says oh you know we try to make a company that doesn't have bosses in many ways you know we don't have managers because like a junior um a uh, junior um, like engineer could go to the senior one and say, "Hey, you're doing this wrong." I tried to imagine that in my head, and it's like, you know what would happen if that really happens? If a junior engineer comes up to a senior one and tells them, "Hey, you're doing this wrong," he would be laughed at. Like, and he would be like, "Shut the yeah. fuck up and do the fucking thing that yeah. you were assigned to." Uh, and then he says, like, we start to talk about management and those sorts of things, right? And uh, we mentioned Valve Company, which allegedly, like, doesn't have bosses. Um, 
Oh, well. You know what yeah. he called that? He said, "Oh, you well, know, oh, that's that. Yeah, well, I know. Well, that's complete anarchy, right?" And I'm like, "No, my guy, no." <laughs> and I can hear, you know, like anti-fascist songs in my hand from the Spanish Civil War era. I was like, "No, that's not anarchy, my guy. <laughs> that's definitely not." <laughs> <laughs> but I was silent, and thankfully, I got the job. And yeah, it's like you know, I was sitting there thinking about like how he was talking about some you know horizontal organizational structures, and I'm like, "Yeah, you know, I have some ideas about that." <laughs> <laughs> Do you happen to have a union around? <laughs> I think they would be interested in hearing that. You will, like all of a sudden, union rep is best friend of the own of their own of the company. Like oopsie daisy, organization <laughs> it, without the bosses. Were, well, that's so when bullshit. When you were talking about the oh the God. interview. It, re it reminded me of that meme mm -hmm. of uh, someone at an interview and it's like so why do you want to work for Megacorp and the guy has this, this thought bubble and in the thought bubble it's him as Lennon leading the march <laughs> um, onto the Winter Palace and then, he's, and then he's imagining like speaking to the workers and then the thought bubble pops and he's like oh uh I, 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 I want to work at Megacorp of course that's my future vision <laughs> yes yes like uh it's so utterly like, I feel you, bullshit. Buddy. I it's feel you. utter bullshit. <laughs> and like he talks about how there are no bosses, right? But you know what that means? It means yeah. that the whole thing is ruled by some sort of big other. This sort of bureaucratic big other. There is really no bosses. Like, I sort mm. of have a boss, because we have a head of the department, right? But um, my boss, like, direct boss, really fucking hates this whole postmodern shit. Like, she used to work in a very, like, specific uh, at a workplace where it was, like, specific bosses. You had a boss, you had your workers, right? It was, like, direct, and it's, like, complete. And, um, now you sort of still have class antagonisms, but you don't mm. have a visible structure. Structure is still there. It's still there because the same people it's, it's sign still your checks. There as the big other. You s well, you I, I refer to it as some sort of big other. You know, this sort of you know image mm. of a thing. You know, abstract conception of 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 a hierarchy. Like it's sort of there. You know, <laughs> but it's not really. They here. say it's not there, but it's there. Yeah, basically, <laughs> um, because and they tr they use it effectively because. It's, it makes the fact that uh, it's a very important thing that Mark Fisher wrote about this destruction of visible hierarchies, right? It leads to mm. more uh, to our job as leftists being more difficult because old age unions become less effective in those environments. Um, old ways of organizing and old ways of... Uh, um, protests become more and more outdated. Like he says, for example, mm. a strike at a university when professors just go out, you know, and strike um, for a day uh, is uh, even sort of supported by university management because you just like go and rally for a day and then you go back to work. That's it. And nothing changes because they because they don't have to pay them. Yeah, you, you don't have to pay them they at that time. Them, and yeah. also, that's a, that's a day of no professor coming into work. That's a day's pay that they get to keep exactly. for each of them striking. Exactly, uh, and that's, the a, lot that's that. a lot of money. Talking about that's a lot of money. I found that very uh, eye-opening as well because mm -hmm. it's because it's like holy crap, striking is actually having the opposite effect to some extent. It's helping yeah. um, because. The, the place of business. People rally, case, the, the and then they and chill I, I down, and they go back to work. Striking. They go back to work. I'm reading that. Yes, exactly. People strike, and then they go back to work. Whatever. It doesn't really... Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Blah. Good job on you for striking. Well, the thing that actually would challenge this system is to challenge the bureaucracy, is to challenge mm. the fakeness of it, you know, to some extent, I believe. You know, drawing a line and telling you are the boss to your boss sometimes could be even more revolutionary than going on a strike. Because you mm, cha challenge the capitalist realism of your workplace. You want to direct, like, hmm. my owner of my company literally complained to me at my job interview that there is an engineer who works here who wants direct deadlines, direct uh, tasks, and direct deadlines. That was a bad thing. 
to be ordered to work is a bad thing in postmodern workplaces. <laughs> Crazy. How are you it's planning crazy. to what, earn what, money? What, what timeline is this? I, I have no idea. What? And like, we didn't even talk about how culture works, right? In post-modern uh, capitalism, and you can go to Zero Books YouTube channel and listen to soothing voice of Douglas Lane and some brainwashing shit, mm -hmm. you know, and on the screen to, uh, to listen to that. Um, some good stuff out there about uh, the, you know, vaporwave as this sort of, you know, haunted art, you know, and um, it's it's very I good stuff. Yeah, I, I want to feel as if it's praxis to, after my colleague at work, mm -hmm. if I ever get a job, has ever t uh, talked to the boss, turned away and thought, man, that's a cool guy. Like, I've, I've, I'm getting the feeling like I should go up to them and say, hey, that's not your friend, that's the boss, don't ever forget yeah. that. Like, it's important to reinforce <laughs> that. I believe that it's a very strong, there is something very strong here. To literally tell someone that, that he is your boss, you know? It's very weird, mm. because in our minds, you know, in the old slave and master, you know, this sort of thing, um, we, we see that the, the person who is in chains, right? This person um, is uh, the the natural response of this person is to rebel, right? Is to break off the chains. But in capitalist realism, in many ways, pointing to the chains is far more revolutionary. And I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. Mm. Yeah. Is there anything else? In, in one yeah. small, well, in one small little exchange of pointing out the change that surround us and our fellow workers yeah. we're taking another step forward to spreading class consciousness and breaking away from the change that is where yeah. yeah that is where praxis lies comrades that's that's what we must strive to do exactly there's that there's that last little call to action i always try to cram in at the end very good <laughs> <sighs> all right people there was a very uh, interesting talk i really enjoyed it. it was rather entertaining i had to shout about my new job which i'm happy to have mm. getting tons of money from it actually <laughs> and uh <laughs> had a bit of a vent about it which was yes good. and uh it's so, so we're, we're working oh we're working God. through this with you eugene thank you. If you want this thank one. you thank you for your support <laughs> tk and all the people who are also supporting me I can feel the solidarity embrace embraced by solidarity from all of you all right people oh there was a very interesting discussion all right um when I try to do mm. the outro, right, in half the time it's all right, the other half I feel completely like, you know, I do the, <sighs> we've done the show, I'm relaxed, and my mind just travels somewhere, and I just can't think of good thi <laughs> things to say, so I'm in this state right now. I apologize, I try to control myself. Thank you very much right, for listening to Radio Sounds Podcast. We do that every week. Uh, support us on Patreon. Subscribe to the channel. Share this thing around. Buy the book on Zero Books and support them on YouTube channel. Good friends from Zero Books. And um, there are some interesting shit that is going to happen in the coming weeks. Um, because, as you know, Zizek Peterson debate is actually happening. That's the thing that is actually mm. going to fucking happen in like two weeks or so. <gasps> and um, I must say that we have a sort of a thing planned for it. Also, uh, an interesting interview with the person. It's not Zizek or Peterson, I must say. It's not a Zizek or Peterson interview, no. Damn. Uh, but it's still very good, and it's going to be very exciting. And um, also, next Friday is uh, March the 8th, right? With the International Women's Work, Work, Working Women's Day. Uh, we must do something about mm -hmm. that, but we haven't still decided on what, but there will be something special, I hope. Um, Post your suggestions in the comments below. Uh, yeah, if, if that will be out by the May, March the 8th, I don't know when we'll post mm -hmm. that. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what our schedule is. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, thank you very, very much for listening and watching. Subscribe, follow, share, like, uh, SoundCloud, iTunes, all of that good stuff. Radio Silence out.